We can do two things. One, don't feed the beast. And the other is be the first to criticize these things. Here are a few clips from an interview between Sean Illing and Mark Lilla. Sean Illing is a reporter at Vox, and Mark Lilla is a professor of humanities at Columbia University and is an avid Democrat and liberal. Mark Lilla had written an op-ed piece for the New York Times that supported the Democrats and argued that the strategy of focusing too narrowly on identity politics can alienate some voters. I have linked to the full interview in the description, but one point that Mark Lilla stressed is that Democrats used to have a more collective message of we. What can we do for one another? How can we all work towards a more equal society? He acknowledges that protest politics had an important role in highlighting who was not included in this message of we. The civil rights movement of the 60s highlighted that African Americans were being excluded from the we group. Feminists like Gloria Steinem in the 70s highlighted that women were not being included in the collective we either. He talks about Reagan's message in the 80s of being an individual. Put your head down, work hard, take care of yourself, and things will work out. The goal for all of us should be that one day things will be done neither because of nor in spite of any of the differences between us, ethnic differences or racial differences, whatever they may be. This message forced the Democrats to respond. Clinton, in the 90s, had to focus with a message more about the economy. He also ended welfare as it was known at the time. I have a plan to end welfare as we know it, to break the cycle of welfare dependency. We'll provide education, job training, and child care. But then those who are able must go to work, either in the private sector or in public service. I know it can work. In my state, we've moved 17,000 people from welfare rolls to payrolls. It's time to make welfare what it should be, a second chance, not a way of life. Mark Lilla argues that the democratic message about the collective we has changed. He feels that identity politics focuses the message too narrowly on individual subsets of identity groups. This game of identity politics excludes all others, rather than attempting to unite and include everyone. Mark Lilla explains that he clearly believes that marginalized groups need help and government assistance, but says that the message of exclusion and division is a bad strategy that results in the Democrats having fewer men and politicians at the state and city levels, and then they have no power to help anyone. To me, Sean Illing does a great job of representing what is so wrong with so many on what you can call the left today. He just cannot seem to get past the mentality that only racists and white supremacists could find any flaw in identity politics. He cannot see that to the vast majority, the federal government getting involved in legislating bathrooms is less important than tax reforms, campaign finance reforms, job creation, or the economy. He seems to be unable to comprehend that a person can be for equality and against violating the rights of transgender people, but that doesn't have to come with automatic agreement that biological sex differences don't exist. In his mind, it appears that if you oppose the government getting bigger and more administrative, and getting involved in more and more policing of how you think and act, it can only be because you are a white supremacist. For him, he cannot see a message that can be delivered to everyone. You either accept all social constructionist statements, or you are a racist. He seems to view everything through this limited lens, and he has great difficulty in understanding Mark Lilla's simple point. This interview took place after at least two other conversations and interviews over the course of many months. If you are on the left, this is an opportunity to see a great example of how the left will eat itself. If you are on the right, you simply hope that things won't change and that the strategy of the left continues to focus on exclusion and segregation. Last year, I posted a video entitled, This is How the Left Will Die, where Sam Harris talks about the left refusing to distinguish itself from groups playing identity politics with less than ideal motives. Little has changed since then, and although very few on the left will openly acknowledge the problem, more telling is the response from the left towards those that do. Now, do you think that the Democrats can avoid getting sucked into the identity politics trap when the Republicans are playing their own version of identity politics. It's just white identity politics. And unfortunately, as you point out, identity politics is a numbers game. And at least for now, there are more white people in this country than there are anything else. So if we're going to get into a contest of identity politics, white people are probably going to win. And that's what is happening right now. Or at least that's what's happening at the presidential level. And so I wonder what your thoughts are about how to, how to get out of that trap. For Sean Illing, 
Everything is identity politics. He thinks that, for some reason, the left is getting sucked into playing identity politics. I, for one, simply disagree with much of the narrative within identity politics and say no. This is enough. I agree that racism exists and that we need to work towards identifying it and removing it. My belief, however, that we don't live in a white male patriarchy that oppresses all other groups is not white identity politics. Placing everyone that disagrees with your position in with KKK members and white supremacists is what alienates people and excludes reasonable views. Next, he suggests that racism is so pervasive that white America only accepted the message of the collective we when it excluded minorities and women. This is just false. Again, if you disagree with seeing people only as members of a victimhood hierarchy, then it is because you are a racist. As long as that picture that was being told excluded those people, perhaps there is parts of the country that were was okay with that vision, right? But once that changed, their interpretation of that story did as well. And the question is, do you acknowledge that the cultural left made these important gains? And what does the left now do in order to you know, bring these people back into the fold? I think a concern a lot of people have, right, is we are currently deep sunk in the middle of an administration that ran a nakedly ethno-nationalist campaign, that has an attorney general, that is reigniting the drug war and attacking voting rights all over the place. And so you, these very marginalized communities feel under assault, and so they're asserting themselves in that context. And so how does the Democratic Party respond to those threats and protect those people uh, without uh, compromising their commitment or without rhetorically offending uh, this percentage of the country that apparently is okay with this. He suggests marginalized groups are asserting themselves as a result of the Trump presidency. Really? Mark Lilla's position is how the Democrats' campaign message alienated some voters during the election. The claim that identity groups acting out are a response to the result is not only false, but doesn't speak to Mark Lilla's point at all. People who oppose identity politics are not, by default, okay with marginalizing groups of people. This is not an all-or-nothing proposition. Next, he becomes an apologist for radical left behavior on campuses and claims that the democratic left is far different. You conflate, you know, campus leftist politics, which are always a little deranged, young people are deranged. I was in college. I mean, this is, you know, I, that you, ex, you expect 20 year olds to, you know, go through their, their, their Chomsky, you know, Marx phase. Um, but to conflate the campus politics with, with democratic politics as such, I think, is a bit of a mistake. Again, the issue is that there is no separation. For instance, other than two op-ed pieces, the New York Times did not offer an article on the campus protests at Evergreen until three weeks after the event. And then the article sided with the protesters and were against Brett Weinstein, blaming him for publicizing the protest and associating him with the alt-right. This is what the left and the Democratic Party do too often. They call you racist, associate you with white supremacy, misrepresent your views, and don't address any legitimate concerns presented. You are discredited simply for disagreeing. This is exactly what Fox News does so often, and there is certainly a way for the left to reduce the impact of the tactic. Mark Lilla's comments on Sean Illing's next question were brilliant. Even if the, the Democratic Party, from the president all the way down, adopted your proposal, and, and said all the right things and just cut out all this crap about identity politics. If six sophomores at Oberlin College walk out of a you know, critical theory course and you know, set fire to a couple of trash cans and, and go on a march, Fox News is going to run with it and they're, they're going to turn it into this giant boogeyman. And, and in this age of post-truth, talk radio and, and, and right-wing radio in general are going to tell this story no matter what. And the people on that side of the aisle they're going to hear it. That's all they're going to hear. And I just wonder if, no matter what the Democrats do, is there any way they can avoid uh, that kind of characterization? And that, if that's the case, what really changes, even if they do say all the right well, things? Well, we can do two things. One, don't feed the beast. And the other is be the first to criticize these things. Yeah? So people see, you know, th that, we're, we, that we recognize this is nuts. Yeah? The, the, there's nothing to be lost there in, in pointing out what is actually the case. 
Um, but, but one thing I think I want to add to this, because I, um, I may leave a misimpression. There's no way to understand American social problems without understanding identity. Unless you have a deep understanding of racism in this country, if you don't have a deep understanding of homophobia and how it works in human beings, you're not going to understand what's going on here at all. So we have to think and talk about identity in order to understand what to do and to figure out who we want to help. But when it comes to actually so addressing those problems, you need to have political power. And the identity thing is not working. So think about identity, pay attention to it to figure out what you want to do. And then when you go out, you've got to persuade people who are unlike you. You know, if I, uh, you know, as I've been saying to college groups, you've got to go to a place where the Wi-Fi sucks, where you have no desire to take a picture of your dinner, <laughs> and you're sitting there with people who have their heads bowed in prayer in thanks for that dinner. You've got to take a big humility pill, co-ed and uh, jock in college. You've got to take a big humility pill, activists. You know, you're willing to go out and go around the world to do good works on your year off or your summer off before you go to um, Morgan Stanley or some other company, right? You take a gap year, do these dramatic, romantic things. They're all good things to do, sure. Let me give you a hard one. Go to Arkansas. Go to a small town where we might have a chance to have a mayor in a medium-sized city. Go to people's picnics. Go to VFW halls, sit in a bar and shoot the shit with people. Get to know them, go to their homes, and try to convince them that we're standing up for, for them, Donald Trump is not. That's a hard task. Let me see you do that. The fact that the left doesn't understand this message and continues to argue about it is troubling for those who are positioned on the left side of the spectrum. Why the fuck did you accept the position? While it is the best news for anyone who sits on the right. The political compass, with a separate axis for authoritarian and libertarian views being suggested by Brent Weinstein, may offer insight as to how to defeat the authoritarian ideology. Otherwise, the reasonable voices on both the left and right may be crushed under the weight of the intolerant who cannot separate reasonable disagreement from white supremacy. Thanks for watching. Remember to subscribe. If you liked the video, be sure to leave a comment and hit that like button. If you didn't like it, please explain why. Open discussion is the only way to have a better understanding of differing views. Sharing this video on social media can help keep conversations alive. Now here are a few other videos that you may be interested in.